A message today entitled, Anointing the Sick. Would you say those three words with me? Anointing the Sick. Anointing the Sick. This is in a series of messages called Portals of Grace. And this is the upshot of Portals of Grace. These are biblical ways that are specially designed by God to bring God's grace into your life through particular elements. Those elements can be water, bread, wine, oil. Uh, they can be touch and wind. And these, God, these are called sacramental worship acts. These are things that God puts in Scripture so that he can touch our lives in a special way, not that he doesn't otherwise, but in a special way to bring his grace into our life. And of course, there's no grace quite like the grace of healing. Can I hear an amen to that? When Jesus died on the cross... It was the final part of his earthly mission, and he rose from the dead. And he had been declaring for three years that he was going to be bringing in a new kingdom. He was bringing in the kingdom of grace. He was bringing in the kingdom of God. And this kingdom of God was going to arrive in the earth. When he rose from the dead, he validated that prediction that he had overcome death. And now the kingdom of God had come into the earth. Now, but the kingdom of this earth, of, 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 of this world, of the devil, and all the things associated with sin and destruction and fear and so forth, this, this kingdom, although its days are over, overlaps this kingdom that has come. It hasn't eradicated that kingdom. So you and I today are in two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. And our allegiance is to King Jesus. Say amen to that. And while we're in this kingdom, uh, the theologian Lad will say that the kingdom of God has come, but not in its fullness. It's here now, but it's not yet in its fullness. The kingdom of God will be experienced by us in its fullness when Jesus returns. Until then, the two kingdoms are overlapping, and we are contending, and prayer is the vehicle which God has given the church to implement the kingdom, to drive out the old and bring in the new. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Thy kingdom come. It has not come in its fullness yet. So we pray it, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And this kingdom that has arrived in Christ, it has arrived. Now we're asking it to penetrate all of the world, right? It penetrates the world in two ways. The first way is through prayer. The second way is through acts of kindness, or you could say social justice, or acts of love for your fellow man. I want to focus on one of the things that happens when this kingdom comes. One of the signs that the kingdom has come is God has granted the church uh, the gift of healing. Healing is a sign of the kingdom of God. You'll see that on our slide. It is a sign that the kingdom of God has come. Luke 10, verse 9, Jesus says to his disciples, who in turn, Matthew 28, they've taught us to do the same thing. It says, heal the sick. And when you heal the sick, what are you supposed to say? The kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God has come near you. You know, we sing about, the king, about King Jesus. This morning I was thinking about, we sing the song, Your Great Name. You want me to sing that, a little bit of that? Thank you, those online. I know you're typing in now. Please sing it, Pastor Dan. See, how does that go? We call. See, we love to call your name it's something we cannot explain that happens when we proclaim your great name your great now don't repeat that let's go right to the bridge king jesus no other name king g you're not helping me jeremy none stronger we can call on you things change when we call on your name that was not it at all, but it was, it was reasonable enough. And I don't know why I put myself through this so off. I love to sing. But we sing in there, King Jesus. When you're singing King Jesus, what do you mean? That's not just a synonym for God. 
You were saying something. He is a king of a new kingdom, and that kingdom has been announced and has arrived. And because that kingdom has been inaugurated, healing and deliverance and the signs of that kingdom are all ready now on display. Not in its fullness, but the signs are already here. It says, when you heal the sick, tell them this. The kingdom has come. That's why you're healed. It says in Mark chapter 16, it says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what does that mean to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom? What does it mean? It tells us what it means. It says, these signs shall accompany them that believe, believe that Jesus is the king, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the savior of the world. These signs are going to follow the church, people that believe in King Jesus. They will lay their hands on the sick and they might recover. They shall recover. Why? It is a sign that King Jesus has come and conquered sickness. He's conquered disease. He's conquered all the effects of sin. You see, healing is the down payment of heaven. Healing is you and I get a taste of the age where there is no death. The little bit of joy we get on the planet is a down payment on the joy you're going to get in heaven. The little bit of love you get, the little bit of peace that you get, the little bit of happiness you get in this life. It's a down payment to whet your appetite, to taste something of the full meal that's going to be given when Jesus returns and ushers in the fullness of his kingdom. This is how healing works. It is the inheritance of the church. It's the unique, healing is a, the unique gift uh, to the church. And there's many ways healing comes into the church. There's more ways to be healed than there are ways to receive anything else in Scripture. Oh, we could have a 50-week series on ways of healing. Prayer of agreement, worship, binding and loosening, holy communion, honoring your father and mother. All of these things, all of these are roads up the mountain of divine healing. God says this essentially. In the world you're going to have tribulation. There is going to be suffering. There's going to be loss. There's going to be setback. The church will be persecuted. You serving Christ will not be popular. I think that day is becoming more apparent. He says you may lose jobs. You may lose even families. You may have things go against you. But here's one thing you can always know. You still have the promise of healing. It might be a poor church, but there's healing in that church. It may be an uneducated church, but there's healing in that church. It may be an underground church, but there's healing in that church. It may be a church outlawed in some Middle Eastern country, but there's healing in that church. No matter what happens, our whole life could fall apart in every natural way, but the Lord says you're still going to have the inheritance of healing. You might be poor, but you should be healthily poor. They might take your house, they might take your car, they might take your job. But you can be healthily unemployed. Now I believe, not healthily unemployed, unemployed with health. That's how I should say it. I believe God gives jobs and of course God gives us blessings. My point of this introduction is that this, this thing of healing is a unique gift to the church. And a church, when we believe in healing and expect healing, more people are healed. Now, is everybody healed? Not everybody's healed. But I'm not going to start there. And I don't think any discussion on healing should ever start on the what ifs. It's better to proclaim what the Word of God says. Let faith arise. And of course, it's a place of grace. 
And we'll talk more about how, how healing comes. Our text today, in this idea of anointing the sick, this is only one of the ways to receive healing, but this is the portal of grace the Bible shows us. Portals of grace, remember, is another word for sacrament. It's a place where a physical element is at play in a miracle. Water for baptism, bread and wine for the Lord's Supper, oil for healing, right? The, the touch, laying on of hands is touch. We're going to talk about singing actually being sacramental, that the wind, the voice is a sacramental act. But we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. It says in James chapter 5, is anyone sick? Excuse me. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Let me pause there. Let him pray. Why? Suffering has lots of causes. And you have to have discernment. You need to pray. Suffering can happen because you're eating a bad diet and you're not disciplined enough to stop it. Suffering could happen uh, because you've disobeyed uh, a, 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 the law of God. Suffering, there's a, there's a, suffering happens all, suffering happens because sometimes we're just in a broken world and that we get flat tires in a broken world. Things happen to us. And the Bible says when there's suffering, we need to pray for discernment. We need to pray for insight. We need, we need to take it before the throne of grace. And then it says, are you cheerful? Are, are you happy? Is life going well? What are you supposed to do then? Sing. Glory to God. Sing praise when things are going good. If you're cheerful about something, the other day, I, I don't remember what I was doing. I was, oh, I was at a stoplight in my car, and just in a, in a moment, I, I, I told my wife, I said, honey, today I feel extremely happy. And I just, just, I use happiness and joy kind of interchangeably sometimes. And it just struck me right there, like, it's like the blessing of God. And I wanted to sing. You, 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 you want me to sing? Okay. King Jesus, no other name. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. In our text today, every verse has the word pray or prayed. This, the book of James, is the oldest book in the New Testament. It is written probably around 50 A.D., James, the brother of Jesus, has not yet been martyred. He wrote the book, Jesus' half-brother. It is the earliest book to allow us to peek into the worship of the earliest church. It's very Jewish. Christians aren't expelled from Judaism until 70 A.D. It's very Jewish. And in a Jewish synagogue, elders were the leaders of the synagogue. And the church adopted a very similar model where elders led churches, although they believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And, of course, Jews were still expecting the Messiah to come. So in this very, very early book that had Jewish practices that had now been Christianized, we have, in it, we have James making a description of how the church should operate. And he says, if there are sick people, this is what you're supposed to do. That phrase, is anyone sick? That first phrase, is anyone sick? What a great phrase. You can advance that slide. Don't you like the phrase, anyone? Is anyone sick? Not just the really holy people or a certain class of people or a certain ethnicity of people or a certain whatever. Is anyone sick in this church? I like the inclusion there. It says, and the word sick is a, there's multiple words for sickness and sick in the New Testament. They all have a variance of meaning. This particular word for sick is tied very tightly to the idea of weakness and being feeble. 
It can have a moral connotation. Primarily, it's used of a physical ailment, disease, infirmity, something that is weakening your body. All right? Does anybody have something that's weakening you? Your strength is leaving, causing you to be feeble. The phrase goes, says, let this person, that's in the, the male pronoun, but it says, let him call for the elders of the church. The initiative is upon the sick person to call for the elders. The context here is that the nature of the sickness as, is, a, is a such that probably the elders have to go to the home of the sick person. I don't think that, I think that's implied. It doesn't have to be that way. What has to happen here is that the sick person requests prayer from the elders of the church. There's an indication of expectancy. Now you notice who they call upon, the elders. The elders here is an officially recognized group. These are the leaders of the church. These are mothers and fathers in the faith. The New Testament says the local church is not organized Really isn't, it isn't really a church until there are elders, men and women that, that provide a level of, of governance under the Lord Jesus for a group of people. Notice it says to call upon the elders of the church, not the elders of the community, not your family members, not your friends. In this particular way of anointing the sick, it says you call on the elders of the church. Again, it's a recognized church with recognized elders. You see, elders of a church, these again are men and women, the spiritual leaders. They could be called pastors or not called pastors. But there's a designation of some kind, maybe deacons or bishops. You can designate them wherever you want. There's a designation. In our church, I would take this to mean even down into life group leaders, altar teams, those that are trained to pray, the leaders of, of, of the church. There's a divine prerogative with elders to do a number of things the Word of God points out. It's a divine prerogative of elders to pray governmentally because the Bible says in Matthew that elders have the, the power to bind and to loose. That is really a governmental action. What I mean by governmental, that is an official action of the church. For example, let's say somebody in this church is in rebellion, is, they're, 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 they're committing adultery on their wife, they will not repent, and they're just raising hell in church. You don't have a right to run them out of the church. That has to be an official action of the elders. The elders say, you cannot come back to this church until you repent. The guy in the parking lot can't do that. There has to be, there has to be an official action. You, you agree with that? There's an official action in something that drastic that's done by elders. Binding and loosening in prayer is, is sometimes an official action. So when praying for the sick, elders do something like this. In this house of faith, as, as under shepherds of the Lord Jesus, the chief shepherd, we bind this thing from happening here and we loose this thing to happen. We bind this disease and we loose the healing of God. It's, it's a different kind of praying. It's a judicial kind of prayer. It's a prerogative of elders to pray that way. And they did, they did a study showing the number of people that are healed, that are prayed by elders and those not prayed by elders. And they have found that prayed by elders, there is an increase in how fast people respond to healing prayer. And it's partly because of the role of an elder. Elders are men and women that know how to pray. Does that mean that other elders or people that are not elders can't pray? Doesn't doesn't mean it's exclusive to them. It's a, it's a kind of a prayer. And of course, elders are responsible for teaching. So elders have the role of healing, binding and loosening, and teaching. Now this particular verse, I call for the elders of the church, this, makes an, this implies that the person asking for prayer is a member of a church. They are asking for his or her elders, that he or she is under the authority of, of these men and women. It's not, it's not somebody who would go around the circuit getting prayer. Now, that's not wrong, but it's not this kind of prayer. It's not somebody who's on a prayer list on, you know, 15 websites. That's okay. People are praying. Praise the Lord. And I believe healing could come that way. This kind of prayer is somebody who is known by the leaders of the church, and, and, and uh, they know the leaders of the church. We're friends. We're, we've walked together. And I know your condition. I know what you've done. And, and I, and I can, because in a minute here, I'm going to start getting personal with you about the sin in your life. And you're not going to go talk to sin with people that you're not underneath their authority. 
right? I mean, because that's, that's kind of personal, right? And it says, and let them pray over him. Oh, I love this. Hallelujah. You don't have to be a counselor here. All you need to be is an intercessor. You don't have to teach or counsel or give advice. Just boom. I guess, no, let's don't spit. Let's oil. That's better. You see, healing comes, and let me give you quickly here. There's three levels for praying for healing. One is you pray for yourself. 90% of healing happens that way. You stand on the Word of God for your own healing. You, you Mark eleven twenty three. 23, you declare healing over your own body. I, in my office, I wrote on my wall, today I receive Jesus as my, not Savior, I put the word healer. I receive him as my healer, and I dated it. This is some years ago when I was battling recurrence of cancer. I said, Jesus, I accept you as my healer. The second, the second way, the second level, is when others pray for you. This is the prayer of agreement. This is a husband with a wife. For, for example, or a cell group, right? A prayer meeting, uh, a group of your friends, let's say. And this is the prayer of agreement. And then the third level, the third level of prayer for healing is when you ask the elders to come. Now, the elders can't pray for every sickness, for everything all the time. You, but this is a summons of men and women who are over you in the Lord who will lay down their life for you in the Lord and they go to war for your healing and your deliverance. Let him pray over him. The anointing of oil is his third level. Now, could you anoint yourself with oil? There's no evidence in the Bible of doing that. Uh, I don't know if it would be wrong, but probably is not common. And then this next phrase is, let him pray over him, anointing him with oil. I love this. This practice of anointing with oil is very familiar to Jewish Christians. They know that priests are anointed with oil, kings are anointed with oil, prophets are anointed with oil when they're placed in ministry. Sacred objects, like for the temple, are anointed with oil. Anointing is an act of hospitality, the anointing of feet, the anointing of hair. The, you remember when Jesus was before the worldly woman and she had the, the oxnard and she anointed his feet, right? And everybody complained how expensive the perfume was that was an act of radical hospitality oil did have medicinal purposes of course um, but oil would not have a medicinal person purpose for things other than something on the skin for example if you have problems in your blood oil would be medicinal but if you had ex eczema you had something uh, you know problems with your skin of course oil scripturally is used for medicine and then Mark chapter 6, 11, very interesting verse. Jesus says, I want you to go out and pray for the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come. And Mark 6, 11 says, and they cast out many demons, and they cast out many demons, I love that, and anointed with oil many who were sick. So somehow the disciples took this commission from the Lord Jesus. He said, go heal people. This particular verse says that when they went out to heal people, it actually shows us the means. It says they anointed them with oil. Now, if oil is just a symbol, just a symbol, it seems strange to me here that, in the, that Jesus' disciples used oil and the early church used oils. One is descriptive of what they did. The other is prescriptive. James is prescriptive, which means James saying, this is how you do it. This verse just showed what they did. This is a description. Now, you might say, did they use oil all the time? We don't know. Did they lay hands on people all the time? The Bible doesn't say. What kind of prayer did they pray? We don't know. But we can read in this verse that oil was used by the disciples at the command of Jesus to heal the sick. You see, I've been to Israel with my wife, and I know a little bit about olive oil. I'm not a cook. Uh, but I know olive oil is good for you. Can I hear an amen to that? Not as good as butter, but it's pretty good. <laughs> it just ain't. Popcorn. Ah, got to get butter. Butter on popcorn. Salt. Salt and butter on real popcorn. Glory to God with a tall 20-inch Coca-Cola. Randa Bashalaba.
I've been to Israel, so I know a little bit about oil. And uh, we've taken 20 tours, my wife and I. Maybe you'd like to go on a tour with us. And I mentioned this to all of our campuses someday. And it's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And we, we love to lead tours. And every time we lead a tour, we show them an ancient wine, excuse me, an ancient oil press. And what they do is they take olives when they're ripe and they put them in, the, in, in, in a big vat and then they have these millstones that are on a large lever and it's about this big and it's probably 30 feet, no, 20 feet long and they press on it. The millstone comes down and squishes the grapes and at the bottom, excuse me, the olives, and at the bottom there's a little hole and the olive oil runs out the bottom. The, there's three pressings. The first pressing of oil is the purest of oil. It's called extra virgin oil. There's nothing in it. There's no seeds in it. it it's just pure oil. And that is used uh, for oil in lamps. It's the most flammable. The second stuff that comes out, uh, the, the second oil is a very good oil. That, that oil, I put it there on the slide, for that oil is used for medicine to, to apply, as I mentioned just a minute ago, to your skin, right? Maybe a little bit in your food too, I suppose, for medicine, but that's the th second. Then the third pressing is oil that's of the lowest quality, and that's for soap. You can wash with oil, I mean olive oil, and, and if it's low grade, it actually acts as a soap. Well, all three of these point to Christ. See, when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, that is the place of the crushing. That's the place of the olive press, right? And Jesus, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, he was crushed for us. He's cr and the idea is Jesus saying, I am uh, the olive. I am being crushed in redemption for you. And there are three things that happen in Jesus' redemption of us that are likened to the oil. And I, and I put this here. The first one, the light, you know, for the fuel, for the lamp that causes light to displace the darkness, God's grace comes into our life. We are in darkness until the Lord turns the light on in our life, until the spirit of election, until the grace of the Lord Jesus comes into our life. We can't manufacture it until by the sovereignty and the power of God, he comes and turns the light on in your life and the darkness of your mind, the darkness of your heart is dispelled. How many are grateful for that? I'm grateful for the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. The second pressing of the olive was for medicine. That's a beautiful picture of Jesus being scourged for our healing. So he goes from Gethsemane to the whipping post. Again, he's being crushed for us. And the second use of the oil there points to Jesus bringing his healing. This is so central to the gospel that is accompanied by physical healing. They are almost inseparable concepts. If you cut out of your Bible, not just the Gospels, but the Epistles, everything that references healing, you'd ha not have a lot of a Bible left. By his stripes, we are what? Healed. Third thing is the cleansing. Of course, speaking of the cross and the forgiveness of sin. All of this in the oil. You see Christ, the word Christ, Christos in the Greek, Messiah, in the Hebrew, literally means, I mean literally, it is the anointed one. Every place you see the word Christ in your Bible, cross it out, put it in the word anointed one, you're on solid ground, because that's what the word means. The word Messiah, cross it out, and put the word anointed one. We always speak of the oil as being a sign of the Holy Spirit, and I believe it is, but it points even to a greater thing. It points to that there is an anointed one his name is Jesus who died on a cross for you. You make the sign of the cross and in this oil we are believing that God not only forgives sins and not only gives revelation but he heals your body. He heals your mind. He heals those dark deep emotions. See, the oil is a sacramental vehicle for divine power. The oil does not heal anybody. It's just simply an avenue for grace. And then they say, once you anoint with oil, you anoint in the name of the Lord. I really like that, this fifth phrase, in the name of the Lord. It really emphasizes it's not the oil. You're supposed to anoint them in the name of the Lord. The oil's not magic. 
The oil is not superstitious and kind of weird. The oil doesn't have to be from Israel. Like I got the, spe- I got the special oil in the special vial. Friends, that special oil in the special vial came out of a big vat of cooking oil. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> it's the prayer that you're praying in the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? The Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one. And the prayer of faith shall save the one who is sick. The sixth phrase is just not prayer. It's the prayer of faith. A portal of grace brings the faith of the intercessor, the faith of the believer. And on this side is the grace of God. And in that sacramental act, faith meets grace and something wonderful happens. But what on this side, it's just not like let the oil do the work. It's the prayer of faith that will save the sick. Now the structure of this in the Greek, there's, a, there's an article in front of the word faith. It really says from, and the prayer of the faith. It's pointing, I believe, to the gift of faith, the charismata, where you have just deposited in you by God in your knower that you know that you know that you know what you're going to say or pray is going to happen. It's not just regular faith. It's the gift of faith. It's not permanent. It comes and it can leave. It's one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. I've had this happen two or three times in my life. I wish I had time to tell you the stories. But I just knew, I tell you, I knew something that I knew so well that if I never saw it, I would still know it had happened. My, the sight became unimportant to me. I knew. Now, I've not had the gift of faith for my own healing. That's a battle for me. It's week by week, month by month, standing in healing. But I have had this, this gift of faith. And this is talking about when elders pray, they wait on God for the charismata. There has to be the gift of miracles and the gift of faith and discerning of spirits. There may be demonic things. It's not just like a wham, bam, thank you, man, you're healed. It's like, let's wait on God for the, for the charismata, the gifts of God to accompany the prayer event. It says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Hallelujah. It's not centered on the faith healer. Like, hey, I got to get in the line of Brother Tom over there. You know, he's really got healing power. Oh, okay. New Testament really doesn't support that. It says in the local church, you got a problem of, of healing? Call on the elders. You don't need evangelists, fancy pants. Oh, that's, that's, sorry. <laughs> evangelist, Mr. Fancy Pants. That's, I just want to just let that, I, I don't mean to be insulting. All I'm saying is we don't need to be superstitious like that guy or that woman. Woo, if I can just get to them. This says, listen, all the gifts are in the church. When a church is healthy and operating, all nine gifts. Now, there are gifts of healing that people operate in, and I would go get in their line. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm not putting faith in the faith healer. I'm putting faith in the Lord, the anointed one. And my faith is that the prayer of the righteous availeth much, that the prayer of the saints availeth much. My own prayer does great things, and then the prayer of elders can heal the sick. A church needs to believe in miracles, pray for miracles, and expect miracles. And it says, then we pray the prayer of faith, God will save those who are sick. The word save is the word sozo. It's a very inclusive word that also implies physical healing. And many, many other things are being delivered from. I want you to know today that the church strongly supports doctors when we strongly support medicine and therapy and science it's not contrary hey i'm on the team of helping people that are suffering get better and if a pill will help you glory to god if a therapist will help you glory to god if yoga helps you take out the new age stuff and do it glory to god hallelujah but friends hear me there is a sliver of healing and none of those other things can do there's a sliver of healing that the church can do when the therapist says no help and the doctor says no help and science says no help there is still a believing church that knows that Jesus said if you believe in me nothing is impossible now you read commentators on healing they, they just fall over themselves trying to make sure they don't say that you should expect healing 
They say, now if you get healed, great, but you know God doesn't heal every time. It may not be the will of God to heal. Well, let me get this. Let's, let's do it this way. If it's not the will of God to heal, let's pray first and do this. God, I'm going to pray for healing unless you tell me it's your will not to heal. I won't pray if you tell me it's not your will. Why do we operate in the negative? I'm going to operate in the positive. He said, pray. Lord, I'm going to pray unless you stop me. It's because the church has been powerless for so long that the church has to make explanation why healing is so few and far between. I say, hey, <laughs> that's the children's bread. This is what we major in. Every service, we believe people get saved, get healed, and get delivered. I never get tired of it. I never get tired of it. The church just ain't about singing and preaching and potlucks. It's, it's declaring a king has come. And then you say, well, what happens if you pray and, and they don't get healed? All right. What are the options here? Not to pray? Is the option not to believe? Well, what happens if they put their faith in God and nothing happens? I'm not God's PR man. I'm a sensitive and grace-based guy. But I cannot always play the what-if game. That's not faith, the what-if game. It's just not. Now, I think in a gracious environment, we're honest. We know not everybody gets healed. I'm, I'm cool with that. We're in, a, we're in an overlap of two kingdoms. Stuff happens. I had recurrence of cancer seven years ago after being cancer-free seven years. I don't know why. I have to fight for my... Sometimes I had bad reports, sometimes I had good. I don't know all the why. Let me help you with healing, and I'm just about done. To, let me help you with something. I think you need to establish your trust in God before you try to establish your faith in God. There, there's a little difference. Now, uh, don't stretch me too far on this theologically, because I'm using the word faith loosely here. But trust is this. I put my trust in you, even though I don't know what's happening, you're good, and this is going to turn out good. I'm going to sleep now. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. Your ways are higher than my own. I trust you. This means help me. In case, it means help. It means I'm dying here. It means like, Airs running out. <laughs> now we sing, I trust you. What does that mean? No matter what happens, I'm in. I'm totally in. I've got nowhere to go. Now that I trust you, I can tip over, toe over here. I'm believing you for great things. I believe for healing. I believe for deliverance. I believe for the prodigals. I believe for revival in our nation. We're believing you. Some of those things don't happen. I don't give up on God. Why? I trust him. I trust. My trust is unshakable. My faith is growing, and my faith can be challenged. My faith is dynamic. My trust is rock solid. Yeah. Hallelujah. And a last phrase here. God might. Verse, dance that in the seventh phrase. The Lord might raise him up. The Lord could raise him up. The Lord wants to raise him up. There's a good chance you're the guy that got the healing that year. Oh, no. It says the Lord will raise him up. Our elders in this church were praying for the sick all the time. We prayed for a young lady Saturday that needs a miracle. We wept with her. We're not gods. We're men that, and women that love this church and know that our calling before God is to pray. Yes. So we go to the throne of grace. Some are healed, some are not. But I'll tell you what's happening. We're becoming a no-cancer zone. More cancers are being healed than I have seen in the history of this church. I refuse to be the cynic and the unbeliever in the what if, the what if, and the why crowd. Say the what if and the why crowd, you just, let's see how many people get healed in your meetings. 
I'd rather be bold for God and sing about a king who heals us and delivers us, who believes that he's really real and there's not a bait and switch with God. The bait and switch meaning he promises stuff he has no intention of doing. So when things don't happen, I say, well, Lord, I'm going to keep believing and I'm going to trust you.